Hallelujah and praise the Lord. Once again, I take this opportunity to bless you because you have been so encouraging to my ministry as a pastor. I want to take this opportunity once again to welcome you to this program and you will be blessed because you are listening. Um, your pastor, Jared Mogo from Full Gospel Churches of Kenya here in Meru town. I'm reading Psalms 137, verse 1 to 4. The Bible says, By the liver of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the populace we hung our abs. For there, for there our captures asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing as one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a fallen land? The title of my sermon today is, Don't Hang Your Ab. An ab is an instrument that is used to sing praise to the Lord. So, don't hang your ab. Don't hang your guitar. Don't hang your drum. Don't hang your tambourine. The children of Israel, when they were captured by their enemies, their enemies demanded from them that they sing a song. But they said they cannot sing a song in a foreign land. They sat by the levers of Babylon. And they sat there, wearing and crying. And their tormentors were, were making fun of them and demanding that they sing a song of the Lord in the fallen land. And these people uh, were very discouraged and they hung their, they hung their up on the tree. A person in exile weeps over the bitterness of captivity. Our sorrow can make it difficult to imagine singing joyful songs again. But my encouragement to you today is you can sing a joyful song again. There is revival. Don't hang your up. And our case study is from the book of Acts, chapter 16, and verse 16. Acts 16, 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for our owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, This man are servant of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When the owner of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Cyrus and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and they are throwing our city into uproar. By advocating customs and lawful for us, Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Cyrus, and the magistrate ordered them to be striped and beaten. After they had been severely frogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving 
giving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, I want you to know that and underline that. About midnight, Paul and Cyrus were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake, then the foundation of the prison was shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew a sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't arm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for right and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Cyrus. He then brought them out and asked, sir, what must I do to be saved? I'll encourage you to read the rest of your story, the, the rest of the story at your time. But I want us to focus on this story. Paul and Cyrus were going to the place of prayer. My brother and sister, in your busy schedule, you must have a place of prayer. A place of prayer is a place of communion with God. Is a place of communication with God. Is a place of special appointment with your maker. Prayer is reporting on duty. Prayer is the greatest force in the universe that moves the hand, that moves the world. Prayer is the greatest force in the universe that moves the hand, that moves the world. And failure to pray is failure in all your life. It's failure of duty, but it's also failure of service. It's also failure of your spiritual progress. A place of prayer is a place of source of your power. A place of prayer is a place of charging. It's a place of your refueling. When you stop praying, I tell you, you start dying. When you stop praying, you start dying. Paul and Cyrus were going to a place of intercession. A time, a place of meeting with their maker. And uh, when they were almost getting into the temple, they were intercepted by a girl, a slave girl who was demon-possessed. And this woman went ahead of them shouting. This girl went shouting. This is this, uh, may, uh, the men are servants of the Most High who are telling you the way to be saved. There was nothing wrong with, this me with that message. But our brother Paul, in the spirit sense, that the, the spirit that was operating in this girl was not a clean spirit. She was a diviner. She was a fortune teller. She was operating under demonic anointing. And Paul realized that this woman was possessed. And what did they do? This girl who was, dub, who was a double slave, she was a slave of the demons, but also so physically she was a slave. She was under some people that were using her to make money. Why? Because she was able to tell people about their future by the power of divination, and she was being paid. And that money never helped this girl it went to our captures. So the servants of God delivered her from this, uh, from this confusion and this slavery. This girl was set free from this demonic attack. And when she was delivered from that powerful demon, the owners of this girl felt so bad. Why? Because their source of income has been closed. Their business has been closed. And there, were, there, there was no hope of making money. 
the spiritual atmosphere of that town changed and the demonic world was rattled and the demonic world responded. How did they respond? They responded by seizing Paul and Cyrus and dragging them away into their marketplace. And then they brought them before their magistrates and they falsely accused Paul and Cyrus for introducing unlawful customs. I want you to understand that Paul and Cyrus were not introducing anything. They just delivered this girl from demonic attack. And the magistrates preached them by ordering them to be striped naked. And they were beaten with rods. They were severely frogged and thrown into the prison. And the, the jailer was authorized to put them, uh, to guard them carefully. So he threw them into the prison, and not only in the prison, into the inner chamber, into the inner cell. And their feet were fastened in the stocks. They had, that means their hands were in chains, and their feet were in stocks. This man of God, in that scenario, in, that, in such circumstances, after being frogged and beaten because of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, I would expect them to be silent and to complain and to murmur and make noise before the Lord. But Paul and Cyrus they were mature in the things of the spirit. They knew how to behave. A believer goes against the current. He doesn't, a believer does not follow the current, flow with the current, but swims against the current. The Bible says, at midnight, I love that. At midnight, Paul and Cyrus decided to pray and to sing hymns to the Lord. And the other Prisoners were listening to them. They were wondering, what are these people doing? We expect them to be nursing their woods. And they are pain. But they said, praise the Lord. They have bound our hands. They have bound our feet. But they have not bound our mouths. We are going to lift up our voices and praise the Lord. And glorifying his name. Praise is to speak well of our God. Praise is to express admiration. It is to compliment. It is to commend our God. It is to congratulate our God for what he is. It is to applaud him. It is to eulogize him. It is to exhort him. They say they are not going to stay in the prison of complaining and murmuring and asking stupid questions. Where was God when they were being frogged? Where was God when they were being uh, thrown in the prison? They never concentrated on the negativity. They decided to praise the Lord. Praise is primarily the expression of admiration, adoration, and approval to God for who he is and what he is. Not because of what he has done, but because of who he is and what he is. We need to know that we need to praise the Lord despite our circumstances and our environment and what is happening around us. Praise is extorting his person, is extorting his character, his attribute, and his perfection. Is telling God who he is. Praise is when we honor God for his character, when we honor God for his power, when we honor God for his mercy, when we honor God for his grace, and when we honor God because of his knowledge and wisdom. Praising is praising the Lord is demonstrating your love for him. Is demonstrating your faith in his ability to take care of your 
problems. This man decided to praise God, to tell God that he has the ability to take care of their problems. They, are, they decided to concentrate on praising the Lord so that the God can concentrate on saving them and arranging their salvation. Hebrews 13:15. Hebrews 13:15, the Bible says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of ribs that confess his name. Through Jesus Christ, my brother and sister, let us continually praise, offer praise to our God. That is our sacrifice of praise. We should not behave like the children of Israel when they hanged their, their, their herbs. The situation and the circumstances around us dictate that we hang our herbs. When we look at our surroundings, when we look at what is happening around us, God is, seems absent so roundly. His absence is so loud until sometimes you don't feel like praising him. Paul and Cyrus were in such a situation, in prison, in pain and agony, not because of any mistake they had done, but because of preaching the gospel and setting this girl free from captivity of demonic attack. As they were praising the Lord, I thank the Lord. God dwelt in the praises of his people. As they were praising the Lord and other prisoners listening, the Bible says, suddenly there was violent earthquake. God has to show up where he is praised. What happened next? Prison doors flew open. Everybody's chains came loose. And the jailer woke up. Wanting to kill himself because he thought everybody has freed from the prison. But Paul st uh, stopped him and told them, we are all of us, we are here. When he came, he fell trembling before Paul and Cyrus. And he brought them out of prison. And asked them this fundamental question. What must I do to be saved? The power of God... That came down as a result of praise. Changed the atmosphere in the prison. The atmosphere in the prison changed because of two men who decided to praise God. When the circumstances dictated otherwise. What happened? We are seeing the kingdom advancing. Even in that situation. The prisoners were listening to Paul and Cyrus as were praising the Lord. The kingdom was advancing. Make sure the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached wherever you are, despite your conditions and your circumstances. Ensure that the name of Jesus is being magnified. And when you magnify the name of Jesus, Jesus has to come down. The gospel was preached to the jailer and his household. And that night, not during the day, that night, they all got saved. They were all baptized same time, same night. I was wondering, where was the baptism pool or the river? But the Bible records, that night, all of them were baptized. All the members of the jailer's family. And this jailer organized and Paul and Cyrus were washed their woods. And he set a meal before them that night. And the Bible says the whole family was filled with joy. The whole family was filled in joy. And in the morning, the magistrates ordered that they should be released. But Paul said... No, 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 no. Paul and Cyrus said, we cannot not just walk out of prison like that. We need to be escorted out of the prison by the magistrates and his officers. Because of putting us, throwing us into prison without going through any court of law. It was against the law. And they were escorted by the officers out from the prison. 
And the Bible says when they went out, they left the city, they went and met brothers and sisters, and they encouraged them. Because this time, after every test, there is, a, there is a testimony. After overcoming this test, they had a strong testimony. And they went to encourage brethren with the testimony of what God had done for them. My brothers and my sisters, I am not ignorant of your circumstances and what is happening around us in the whole world. In this period of coronavirus, many things have been destroyed. I know there are so many people, their businesses have been affected. Many have lost their jobs. We have lost our family members in this sickness and disease. The economy has slowed down. I am not ignorant of that. We are, we have found ourselves in a prison. We don't know what to do. We are in our darkest moments. Some of us, we are in our midnights. Some of us, we are in the pits. Actually, Psalms 30, verse 5. Psalms 30, the psalmist found himself in that, in that kind of a situation. In his midnight, he says, For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts uh, a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Maybe you are in your midnight. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to do with your family, with your children, with your business, with your own. Very many things. You are just surrounded by darkness around you. You are in your midnight. Maybe you are in your pit like Psalms. Psalm 40 verse 1 and 2. The writer of this psalm was in a pit. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of slimy pits, out of the mud and mare. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Maybe you are in your pits. You are weeping in your pits. You are in mud. In Ma, the situation around you is very slippery. It is very slimy. You don't know what to do. But this man, the writer of Psalm 40, decided to wait on God. My encouragement to you, even to myself, wait on God. Our God will come. He will deliver us from that pit and he will set our feet on a rock and give us a firm place to stand. Maybe your business has gone down. You are in your darkest moments. Maybe you can confess like the writer of Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk, his business went down. He was a, a, a farmer. He had uh, so many animals, but for some, uh, for some reason, we don't know what happened. And he wrote in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. And this is what he says. Though the fig trees does not burn, and there are no grapes on the vines. Note the fig tree, note the vines. Though the olive crop fail and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Let's go back to verse 17 and underline this was a very serious farmer. This, was, uh, this farmer was uh, involved in agribusiness. He had fig trees, he had grapes, he had olive crop. This man was a farmer. There were some produ produce in the fields. And for some reason, he found himself with no fig trees. He found himself with no grapes and no olive crop. He found uh, himself in a, in, with a pen without any sheep. And with the stalls without any cattle. This man decided to do something 
in verse 18. He decided not to hang his up. He says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the... This man, this very serious businessman, a serious farmer who did agribusiness. For some reason, the Bible is not, not clear. He found himself without any fig in, his, in the trees and no grapes on the vine. He met, he met in a, himself in a situation where there was no olive crop and there was no food, no produce in the field. And for some reason, there was no sheep in the pen or cattle in the store. In that darkness, in that midnight, in that prison, in that pit, he decided to do something. He decided to lift his eyes up. And when he did that, the Bible says, he says, I have made up my mind. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will not rejoice because I have money in the pocket or I have stock in the warehouse. I'm not going to rejoice because I have bumper harvest, but I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Not in my money, not in any progress, but in the Lord. That is what praise is all about. It's praising God for who he is and because of his personality. Whatever appears difficult in your life is only waiting for you to do something. It's waiting for you to praise. There is power in praise. There is miracle power. God of miracle signs and wonders shows up where there is praise. The first sermon of Jesus, and that is what I want to conclude with, came from the book of Isaiah chapter number 61. I'll read verse 1 to 3. The first sermon of Jesus. Jesus giving us his job description. Why he came. Why he manifested. Why he came and be born and stayed with us. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me. Number one, to preach good news to the poor. Number two, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Number three, to proclaim freedom to the captives. And number four, release from darkness for the prisoners. Number five, to proclaim the year of Lord's favor. And number six, the day of vigilance of our God. Number seven, to comfort all who mourn. Number eight, why Jesus came. And provide for those who grieve in Zion. Maybe you are grieving in Zion. Jesus came so that he can provide to you. Number nine, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. That's why Jesus came. To bestow on you a crown of beauty. Number ten, to bestow on you the oil of grandness. Instead of mourning. And number 11. And a garment of praise. Instead of a spirit of despair. And finally. To change our name. Number 12. Why Jesus came. So that he will, we, they will be called. Oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord. For the display of his splendor. I want to challenge you my brother and sister. To stand and take up your herb from where you have hanged it. And uh, confess, pray and make declaration. Using Isaiah 61. Declare yourself out of that prison. Out of that darkest moment. Out of your midnight. Declare yourself out of your pit. And you know what? God is going to show up. Because Jesus is the same yesterday. He is the same today and forever. What he did in the Bible days, he can do it even today. In the name of Jesus, I want to 
call you out of your darkness. I want to pray for your grace. To pray for grace. To take you through your darkness. May the Lord put a new song in your mouth. That you may, you are going to hang down your, your heart from where it is. Put it on your shoulder. Take your drum and your tambourine. Start praising the Lord. Start praising the Lord. And something is going to happen in the name of Jesus. May, may the Lord give you the grace to praise him. May the Lord lift your spirit out of your situation. May your, may your eyes look up to God. Not around your situation. Don't look in your stalls and in your pain. Lift up your eyes and look unto heaven where your help comes from. And the Lord who sent adequate during the days of Paul and Cyrus, he is the same. He is the same. And you show up in your prison in the name of Jesus. There is power in praise. Today I'm not going to pray for you. I want you to stand and start praising the Lord. Start praising the Lord. I'll continue praising my Lord on my side. Continue praising the Lord on your side. And the Lord is going to show up in the name of Jesus. Come on. Hang down your hub and start praising the Lord. May the Lord bless you as you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Jana, inangu vuleo, na milele. Oh. 